Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well in these extraordinary times. Welcome to the FF Virtual Arena, where today we're going to be taking uh, a wee bit of a look at hybrid working. Uh, I am uh, Ali Patterson, uh, Editor-in-Chief and Founder at uh, FF News Fintech Finance, and I am very pleased to be joined by quite a varied selection of panellists. Um, first of all, we have Howard Moore from Mobiquity. Howard, Howard, where, whereabouts in the world are you today? Uh, I'm in London, actually. Excellent, excellent. And just, what, what is your, your role at uh, Mobiquity? Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Digital Banking, and uh, Mobiquity is a digital consultancy. So we design, build, and help market digital products and experiences. We're, we're generally, we look at all of the problems that we're faced with from a human centric perspective, and then apply tech agnostic views over that to try and solve the problems, but always with a human focus. So very much looking forward to today's human centric problems that we're discussing and how we help to solve them with technology and, and better and brighter ideas. Absolutely, that human part, we're definitely gonna be drawing in from you to talk about uh, hybrid working. Uh, we also have uh, Laura Cole from Standard Charter. Laura, Laura, whereabouts in the world are you? And what's your role? Uh, your role? Um, at the moment, I'm up north near um, Manchester, <laughs> um, sort of in between actually Blackpool and Manchester. Um, my role is Managing Director, Head of HR for the UK and Europe. And um, very recently actually moved into that role. So it's actually uh, probably hitting the 30 day mark because it was the, um, the 1st of Jan that I took on that role. Um, I also lead our employee experience practice as well at Standard Chartered. Um, so focus very much on human centered design um, techniques sort of mapping out the employee journey as well. So this um, this is a really hot topic for us because I think um, hybrid working is something we've focused on for the last couple of years in the pandemic. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I actually have uh, I came across an old stack of uh, swag uh, from you guys from uh, from various uh, various cybuses uh, over the over the years. Um, and lastly, from Plio, we have Jesse Donny. Jesse, wh wh whereabouts in the world are you? And wh what's your role at Plio? <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'm calling you out of Cairo. So I'm actually in Egypt. And um, yeah, I travel permanently. So it's, uh, of course, exactly right. Um, yeah, and I'm head of people. So what that means is covering everything related to people and culture. So it's everything on the employee experience side, uh, you know, to workplace, to hiring and people partnering and learning and development and uh, a lot of future of work uh, and forward thinking work as well that, that we love to do. That's me. Right, let's uh, let's get straight into it. So, first of all, I, I kind of want to look at to what extent hybrid working has been implemented across the banking and the finance industry. Um, it's specifically for uh, um, the UK, but how does the UK compare to the rest of uh, of Europe and EMEA? Um, how, Howard, I'm going to go to you first for this. I think that the UK is no different from the rest of the world at the moment and everyone's had to react to the government authorities and and the various restrictions over the last two years almost exactly now from from when they've been put in place and there's been a varied level of regulations and restrictions that we've all had to scramble to deal with in order to then be able to manage fully remote hybrids and fully in the office and i think that because it's been such a global problem we've got many different ideas coming around on how people solve it and as we come out of it hopefully there, there are a lot of lessons to be learned that we can take from a global perspective to, to find the best ways to interact with uh, our colleagues and have the best uh, employee experience around hybrid working absolutely laura, laura let's go let's go to yourself i think the the sort of implementation of hybrid working has probably been a bit mixed across different geographies depending on lots of different factors so i think to howard's point the government guidelines have obviously been quite different depending on which market that you're in but also actually we've certainly seen being in a lot of emerging markets that you've got challenges even around things like um, speed of internet for people being able to work at home in, in some of our geographies like india um, but also actually the the sort of different cultural norms, I think, in terms of 
the the sort of working from home as a concept and then that being able to sort of transition into into hybrid and also where we've got markets um so not in europe but sort of um in Asia, like Hong Kong and Singapore, where people typically live in smaller accommodation and often multi-generational family as well. And that just changes the proposition a bit in terms of whether you would actually want to work um, a number of days at home. And actually people, particularly in Hong Kong, like going into the office because it's um, sort of an opportunity to not be in such a small confined space. So I think there are some of the challenges that organisations are sort of having to work through when they think about implementing hybrid, that there is a lot of backdrop, I think, of, of different circumstances that might be related to your infrastructure and um, sort of cultural norms, um, and then also government guidelines that have sort of evolved over the last couple of years as well. Such a great um, example there with Hong Kong. I mean, as you said, it's, it's all about that context there. Um, I, I saw a, a phenomenal tweet um, a few months ago actually now but it's one of those ones that sticks with you which was saying that the uh the excuse of internet issues is the new ah oh, my train was delayed for uh for all the hybrid work and happening um jesse let's, let, let's go to yourself obviously because you've got quite a, a a global view in many ways so from from your perspective what extent has hybrid working been implemented in in banking hmm i think it's actually so great that we've had this i mean out of a terrible situation, I think it's been really refreshing to be able to become much more accommodating to people. I think the fact that we've had to work hybrid, I mean, Plio itself has always worked hybrid. So um, we've had that option of having remotes full time, just doing their thing and people on site. But if you've had that culture, you can easily learn from, um, from those people as well. And I think it's brought in quite a healthy attitude we're much more at least what i've seen is people are much more their whole selves at work their kids are there it's part of their experience it's it's actually brought a lot of um i think intimacy as well out of necessity but that's also been able to to help you get through a really tough time together so uh, i think there's actually quite a lot of light to be seen out of a really tough situation let's um Let's break down sort of hybrid working because obviously throughout the pandemic, a lot of people had to work completely, completely virtual. And we are now kind of, especially there's lots, lots of headlines. There's the the daily on one side, there's the Daily Mail headline saying everyone back to the office. And it, it, it does seem that hybrid is the future as opposed to either completely remote, complete, uh, complete at home. So what are the what are the practical barriers, uh, if any, that still remain that prevent this adoption and implementation of, of hybrid working? Um, I'm, I'm going to go to, to you first, actually, Laura. I think the first one is lots of organisations, I think, actually hadn't worked necessarily in a hybrid way, particularly in the financial services sector. So I think pre-pandemic, a lot of organisations were used to face-to-face working. You know, people would obviously come into the office potentially sort of four or five days a week. Um, during the pandemic, it forced everybody to work from home. So there was that sort of um, equal playing field and, and platform in that sense. And then as the government guidelines particularly are changing in, in different markets, there's now the ability to really I think experiment and kind of test hybrid working for the first time if it's if you are an organization that hasn't really done it before. So I think against that backdrop, some of the the sort of barriers are one, is it actually ingrained yet in your organization culture, which I think for a lot of financial services firms, it sort of hasn't been historically because there has been that that sort of um going into the office five days a week and and almost I think a bit of a culture of presenteeism as well at times. So the first thing I think is is sort of is the organisation culture ready to adapt, and that particularly I think is linked as well to leadership. And are your leaders going to be role modelling the right behaviours? What you obviously don't want to see is um, leaders sort of saying that everybody needs to go back into the office, but actually you have then a, a hybrid working policy because the two things then don't kind of line in terms of um, of that role modelling. Then I think there's a big piece um, in terms of barriers, but also enablers, is that we need to make the workspace different to reflect hybrid working. So there's lots of research out there now, particularly people like Linda Gratton from the London Business School, who are saying that work needs to be more purposeful in terms of where and sort of how and where work gets done and so your 
workspace needs to correlate to enable hybrid working. So I think if you're an organisation that isn't then thinking about how do you use space differently, how do you encourage people to come into the office to collaborate, to connect, etc. Um, you're going to find, I think, challenges implementing hybrid working because it, it, the sort of office space isn't then set up for that, you know, connectivity that people need and probably then the other is also around technology so if you don't have the right technology infrastructure again I think that's a barrier to hybrid working because what you're sort of seeing now I think is a lot of employees saying that the technology works better at home because they might have better internet you know they're able to use different tools and um, that they might be able to use in the office so it's how do organizations respond to some of that and sort of think through those enablers in order to make it work I think. It's a really good point with the technology. Um, I always remember a quote from uh, Professor Eddie Obeng, who said, uh, what, what, why do you want to go and spend two hours a day to go and use a slower computer than you have at, at home? And I was like, well, I, I see your point Your point there. Um, Howard, what, what um, I mean, we talked a little bit about the technology there, but what, what are some of the barriers that, that are preventing not just the adoption, but this implementation of hybrid working? Um. I think Laura raised some amazing points there, and I wholeheartedly agree with all of them. I think from a technology standpoint, and particularly when we look at the banking sector, which is heavily regulated, and lots of security issues around the access of information and transfer of information, it is more complex to have people working remotely or have people in two different locations in a hybrid situation and still be able to ensure your security. And that's both from a, a, a physical standpoint and the access to information, but also from the, the workplace guidelines that we all have in place to make sure that everybody is safeguarded and everybody is in an environment where they can thrive. And that further to Laura's point about the culture, you know, the, I grew up in, the, in banking in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s. And, there was a very strong culture of presenteeism and a very strong culture of uh, managers having people in front of them so that they could ensure their behavior. And this poses a, chain, a challenge to that, uh, hopefully a very positive challenge. But with the technology and the comfort that can be provided around the security, you can then work on the cultural aspect of it to ensure that people are doing or meeting their, their, being their most productive, I guess is the best way to put it, and which is what we want, and, and having the best employee experience. Jesse, can I get, get your thoughts there, especially, you know, that was your cue when we talk about employee experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for me, I really like what the two of you have said. So maybe to add on that, if we look at culture, we could chat a little bit about the types, the ways of working. So I think something really to look out for here is meeting equity. So now we are so used to, before uh, Corona in this case, uh, a lot of us were used to being able to have important meetings together in one place, look each other in the eyes, and this is how it works. Uh, and now we have this amazing freedom where people are having much more flexibility, but we are still thinking in, in, a, um, in a way that can still be quite dated. So if you're having a very serious meeting, perhaps the way you're experiencing people on the ground is different from the people calling in. And so it's all about that meeting equity, that you're giving an equitable experience to the person that uh, is sitting in the room and the person that is sitting in you know, their bedroom. Uh, and that should be the same. So a big focus should be on how do you bring meeting equity in everything you do? There's a lot of education on anything. It's, it's really on your meeting design, right? Like think when you're designing this, are you designing it for active participation from an introverted remote who you know, needs a little bit of teasing out to be able to have their valuable, valuable input and uh, to actually have that put forward. Uh, so I really think that's the, the part that we're at least investing on heavily. Um, and also through this, it's easy to lose sight of transparent communications. If you're not seeing everybody as often, it's harder to know what's going on. The water cooler conversations are happening with some people. And what about the people who aren't getting them? So also, I just think the need for transparent communications is becoming more and more uh, necessary. Can I just jump in there on the transparency issue? Because I think it's really important point you raised there, Jesse. I think transparency over all of the issues 
around the reasons why things are and aren't working is just so important when we look at hybrid working. And it's very much about people, both from a cultural and from an infrastructure perspective, being as transparent as they possibly can. And people raising their voices or raising their hands and saying, this is or this isn't working for me. Or, and particularly in when you talk about meeting equity, which when we start talking about the metaverse and all kinds of interesting topics like that, it, it becomes a very emotive topic as to how, whether people are have, feeling that they're having their voice heard. And the more transparent we can be around that as we manage people in these situations, the better off everyone's going to be. Can I as well to expand on, you, you mentioned something there, Jesse, about um, the sort of nuances where you have, say, some introverted people. Do, do, do you think that there's almost uh, a separate business etiquette that has developed for hybrid working, such as, oh, you put your camera on, I put my camera on. Is there that almost, uh, um, uh, it's almost like a completely different business culture? Oh, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, I think we're all underlying as human beings, right? We're all trying to connect. I think that's remaining the same, but the way that we're used to connecting is changing. So we're still desperate for that connection when we're at work with people every day. But uh, how we do it is is changing for sure. Uh, and also asking someone to put on their camera, that's from a neurodiverse perspective, that is questionable whether that's actually the right thing to kind of demand people to do. Like, are you, you know, going into their space that isn't necessarily fair either. So it's actually quite a tricky one if you look at uh, the expectations we're suddenly putting on people. Uh, in order for ourselves to feel that we can connect and I'm talking to real people, but, uh, but what am I also doing to the other person? Um, and yeah, we haven't really said anything on this yet, but but I think that will come. I think that's definitely a, a, a big, well, uh, I want to, I wanna, um, let's get kind of very big picture. I want to look at some of the big broad strokes around, but also look at the bottom line. Um, let's look at some of the pros and some of the negatives of, of, a, of a hybrid working setup, um, not just on the people itself, but the knock-on effect on that fiscally. Um, you could argue, you know, you have the, the ability with everyone working at home, the scalability becomes a slightly different, uh, slightly different kettle of fish. Um, equally, it, it could also have huge cost-saving implications on one side of physical space, but Zoom accounts ain't cheap. Um, so, L Laura, can I get you to weigh in on this? What, what in, in nice big broad strokes, what are some of the benefits, but also some of the negatives and what can't be addressed of a hybrid working setup? I think some of the the big benefits are around flexibility for your employees and productivity. Um, and I think the productivity argument can sometimes sort of almost be a bit of a double-edged sword because there's a lot of people that say actually um, not not having people go into the office sometimes you're losing some productivity but I think there is data out there that says that hybrid um, approach is, is sort of the, the, the best. I think from a flexibility perspective a lot of the um, the sort of employee listening and employee experience research that we did internally over the last couple of years just reinforced constantly that employees now want that flexibility and I think if you're going to attract and retain great talent then you need to offer that flexibility to me it's not a, a nice to have anymore it's very much a must do and it's it's expected I think if you're an organization that doesn't offer that flexibility and I think that's within the parameters of where you can have that flexibility in certain roles particularly in financial services there probably are some roles like if you're um like a branch teller you know in in the in a branch it's going to be like more difficult to be able to do that um necessarily from home but i think in the main if you're sort of knowledge based workers that is sort of a really core um employer value proposition to offer that flexibility i think you're not going to as I say re attract to retain the right talent if um if you don't have it um there's obviously the piece around um office space so if you do have more people um able to work in that hybrid way there are um potential opportunities i think for some cost savings around your office space that said we are seeing i think in a lot of um, sort of external research now that actually employers are starting to think about how to use that space differently. So it might not necessarily actually result in 
office space reduction per se, but actually that you would be redesigning that office space to encourage when people do come into the office, it's a place for connection, it's a place for collaboration, um, but also actually seeing that there are organisations offering social elements too, like how do we support people with their well-being. So I think, again, that's a bit of a two sides to the coin in terms of, you know, as an organisation, what you would want to do. There are obviously, um, you know, some um, some potential um, cost savings, depending on sort of how you would um, would play it. So I think they're probably some of the the, the kind of key big ones when you think of, of some of the themes. Howard, can I get your your thoughts here? What are some of the elements that can't really be be addressed? Um, just going back, perhaps one step, just on the uh, the benefits of the hybrid working setup. Before I answer that question, Ali, I think that um, in 2022, the big issue that we're facing, certainly in our sector is the, the war for talent. There are, there are a lot of people that are, are looking around and banking, we, we've been having this issue in banking for a while as people get attracted to perhaps uh, potentially more uh, sexy and cool tech industries and, and those sorts of things. And by having a hybrid working setup, as Laura explains, and having that flexibility, that it widens the talent pool. And it's not just geographically. What what it does is it allows greater inclusion of people that potentially were excluded previously for, for various reasons to actually have access to this working environment via hybrid or, or remote working. And I think that's a really important benefit because we need to be able to attract the best people to our industry and to our individual companies. And if we can do that through flexibility and through hybrid working then we have a great advantage which is really what we're all looking for in the war for talent in 22. that's uh, um that's one of those lines that if i you know if i'm sat here in the audience i'm going to be tweeting that out it, it, that war for talent out there is uh, definitely definitely heating up um jesse can i get your, your your thoughts here yeah maybe just to extend on what you're saying there uh, Howard, that was really, uh, really well put. And um, I think that's amazing. You can hire everyone now. But let's let's just be a little bit selfish and, and act as Europe for a second and say, OK, we have access to great European talent, African talent. If we look at EMEA, Middle Eastern talent, Indian talent, we've got a great region here. We can often compete on salary here, but just a con is that the place that uh, we can't compete against normally is the US. So I think the war for talent is is going to really take it to the next level once the US learns how to work async and we have the likes of, uh, you know, even just the normal Silicon Valley startups and scale ups who come and are starting to uh, attract our own candidates uh, and our own current colleagues. I think if you look at a, a starting salary from the Valley, what? You're sitting at what between 100 and 120 k dollars a year that's just an unrealistic starter salary in in europe so i think we're also going to see um as a a bit of a warning to us is is we're going to see tough competition with salaries soon once uh once we start to see competition from the us come in and that's uh that's something that's just back of my mind um and maybe something else is that we still all really want to meet up physically and we will, we can make that happen with people all over the world and it's phenomenal how the world can just connect. Um, but that itself is expensive as well. So now, though it's great that you can hire, um, you know, one of my colleagues is sitting in Cape Town, I have another colleague who's sitting in St. Petersburg and I can bring them together for the People Team Team Camp. That's like incredible. The trouble is also that's, that's expensive if all the teams in, in the company keep doing this. Uh, and that also has a really bad environmental footprint. So we've also actually got to look out for our own footprints here as well, as we hire more like this. Um, yeah. Oh, that's such a good point about, because on one side you would instantly think, yeah, hybrid working, it definitely going to increase sustainability. But on the flip side, you're then hiring people from all over the world. So if you do have a physical meetup, you then suddenly have uh, a, lot, a lot more planes in the air for longer than you may have if it was all just hired locally. That's... Um, yeah, sorry, H H Howard, uh, How Howard and Laura, can I get you, you just your thoughts on that sustainability angle? 
I was going to say, I think the jury is still out on the impact from a sustainability angle, because I think probably day to day, you might see people commuting less than they perhaps did previously, but actually that's then more people at home with heating on, aircon on, you know, all of those kind of things that um, also sort of add to our our carbon footprint. So I think it's going to be really hard for organisations to measure the the sort of sustainability impact because there is a bit of a, a balance. Like you were saying, Jesse, there's, there's that angle if you're bringing loads of people together for face-to-face meetings and they live further apart, then there's that angle. But there's also, um, as I say, people having technology on all day um in sort of uh, multiple locations than than there was previously so i think it's a bit it's a bit of a tough one actually to sort of work out is it is it sort of um for the better or or, or not i think at the moment i think that becomes interesting here i was in the city yesterday actually i actually had a face to face meeting which was something interesting and refreshing um but i walked around a little bit before the meeting and the number of offices where i was and the, all the lights were on and there were people at the doors, but there was nobody in the open plan offices. So everything was there and it was running, but the people were working remotely. And if you think about that from a sustainable point of view, that's the worst of both worlds because we've got people working from home and using the resources there and the resources are still up and running for those people that may come in on a given day. And I think we, uh, at a point where although sustainable and hybrid working aren't necessarily one and the same things we've got to a point where we can start to bring sustainable goals in and have them as part of the company ideals along with hybrid working and remote working uh, guidelines and setting out and so we, we can envision situations where you know floors of offices or whole offices are actually not operational on given days or they're operational for certain specific tasks while the the workforce is at home or, or remote and then other days where it does fire up if you like and people are then expected to be there to make the use of that and i think you know, companies need to think about these goals in parallel and potentially you know we've been given the opportunity to do that at the moment almost a demand for something like a almost like a hybrid working I'm actually not going to say that. Scrap that part. I was going to say hybrid working is a service, but everything is a fucking service now. Um, scrap that part of me, ed- editors. Um, cool. Um, let's let's have a look at though at some of the financial institutions that are are refusing to implement uh, hybrid working. W- what what's the, our reaction to to those? And do you think that's almost a, um, a lack of knowledge around some of the well potential implementation of tools that could allow this? What's your thoughts on certain uh, institutions that are refusing to move into this hybrid way? Um, Jesse? Yeah, I, th- I think maybe the, the better question there is the, is the why, right? Like, is there a really good business reason? Very few companies refuse for good reasons. Um, is it more emotional? Is it the lack of trust in your employees? I think you really need to go and dig a bit deeper and say, okay, well, what's making me go, no, no, no. Um, And is it a really like reasonable, valid business reason where in that case, I think they should, I don't think they should have hybrid work if there's a really good reason not to. Um, But if it's, I don't trust my employees enough. I don't know what they do at home. How do I know if they're working? They're probably just on, what would they be on? Instagram? TikTok? I don't know. Uh, Depends on the institution. Um, you know, that's then much my space. Well, I was going to go for that, MSN. Uh, but that is exactly on um, the employee trust. And actually, are you trusting the people you hire? And if you don't, as an employer, then then you've got a problem. You need to be able to trust the people you hire because they're trusting you with their career as well and a lot of their life. So so the trust is, is very much a two-way street. And that would be my... Um, my feedback to them. That's another tweet that if I'm watching this, I'd be going, ah, oh, that's, the, that's the quote there, that that trust is, is definitely a two-way, a two-way street. Um, uh, Laura? I think from a sort of overall talent attraction perspective, for me, it's, it's not a nice to have, it's a, a sort of must have if you do want to attract the right talent. That said, I think 
for financial services firms, I think the challenge is typically the industry is a bit more cautious because of the you know regulatory backdrop often. Um, and actually, I don't think hybrid has been fully sort of tested yet. And I think that's maybe the reticence of a sort of reservation of, of some organisations to um, to sort of fully embrace it. Like I said before, we, we've kind of had the the COVID experiment was everybody working from home and we sort of had everybody. So our points around the sort of parity around inclusivity that was there when everybody was working from home and we've done the everybody working in the office sort of pre-pandemic but it's it's the next sort of year or two I think as to whether actually is this a proposition that is going to land and I I do wonder will some more financial services firms sort of change their approach once they see that it could work for for other organizations but I think for that broader talent piece for me um it's a must do. I just think when you look at generationally like Gen Z, that I just that they want that flexibility. Um and, and I think if you don't offer that, you are limiting potentially the talent pool that you you have access to. Absolutely. H- Howard, can I get your your thought your thoughts on this? I think that it comes across as a, a very draconian idea and it certainly grabs all of the headlines in the press it's something that we're all going through and you, i we all saw the headlines of you know so and so ceo of large tier one bank says everybody must be in the office um and it's almost from my perspective there's a i'm aghast at such an idea whereby you know to jesse's and to laura's point it, it's about asking why why aren't you allowing this to happen every it is sorry it is definitely the way that the world is going it's what people are after people's experience over the last couple of years where it's been forced upon them has largely been positive in some ways and and so in some ways it's not been as positive but offering hybrid then allows people to explore the best of those worlds and I, i can't understand why people would make a blanket statement like that without fully investigating what works best for their employees and for their business. Nah, I completely agree with you there. It, do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of those uh, wonderful quotes that about Blockbuster saying, I don't, you know, Netflix is, is never going to catch on or uh, Kodak uh, saying, why would we want to have a digital camera? We can't sell film. It's, it's that kind of, it's always been done that way. It does seem to be a throwback to the past. I think your point's very valid there. It seems to be this idea, well, we need to go back to the way things were because that's how it used to work and that worked for us then. And the world's changing and moving on and technology with it. And it's allowing this to be possible and people's managerial ideas need to move with the cultural shift. Absolutely. I think we're definitely seeing the the, the results of that at the moment. the, the last thing I kind of want to bring up is um, I, I want to look um, I want to look to the future. Do, do, do you think that uh, banks and financial institutions are going to fully adopt remote work in the future, and are, are we going to even end up you know in a complete sort of uh, metaverse uh, when it comes to all things uh, uh, work? So you'd almost sort of log in and be in, be in a virtual environment. Uh, Jesse, Jesse, I'm going to go to go to go to you first here. <laughs> Sure. Well, it's definitely an aspiration of ours at Plio to be able to offer remote work to as many people as we can and to go towards that because we've just seen such success through it. And, you know, we just become a better business. And, you know, how was speaking earlier about diversity of thought um, and that really like you just everybody knows by now that like diversity also drives your bottom line. It's just a smart business idea aside from anything else. So we'll definitely be pushing that and encouraging our, our peers and everyone else in the industry to to do the same. I think uh, I think we should jump on this and, and enjoy it as well. Instead of being scared of it, I think we should really try to figure out, okay, how can we build this together and come together as a community? And uh, imagine if you saw financial services really leading the way here, that would be quite something. And I think it's an industry with really smart people who could do that if, if that was the choice. That's from me. Do, do you think, um, so I just want to unpack one thing that you, you, you said there, that obviously you guys at Plio are very keen on, on, on hybrid and remote working. Do, do you think that if you were the only financial institution out there that was doing it, 
you would almost have to sell people on the idea of remote working. But because it's now becoming the norm, you have large banks like Standard Charter getting into it, it becomes a lot easier. It becomes, the toothpaste is out the tube, it becomes expected. Uh, I think it's actually kind of been the other way around for us in that because we started remote work six years ago, players are six and a half, nearly seven year old company, right? Because we started it, that was what set us aside years ago. And today we've just become we've become less progressive, to be honest. Now we have to find, well, what's our cutting edge? Because that used to be very cutting edge. So uh, <laughs> so everyone's catching up with us. So we used to sing it loud and proud. And now it's just something that, of course, you have to offer, like Laura's saying, right? Of course. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Laura, can I get your, your, your thoughts in here in terms of that kind of, sort of full remote working experience in the future? Fully remote, I'm, I'm just not sure. And, and the reason I say that is even internally when we've, um, I said, we've sort of done regular surveying and, and sort of EX research with our employees. And the data told us that it was like less than 5% of people that wanted to work from home full time. Um, and I think that's because human beings are wired for connection. So I think the bit that you miss when you're at home all the time is those sort of serendipitous moments, like where you might have been in the office and you would have gone and got a coffee and bumped into somebody, you know, on the way down the stairs to to go and meet them. I think it's that sort of, the, the sort of building connections piece is why I think fully remote for the vast majority of the workforce I think will be challenging which is why the 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 sort of hybrid blend which means you know if I need if I've got loads of um, video calls because I'm working with people in different locations and I've got some really focused work that I need to do I can do that from home with no distractions maybe if you have a toddler like I do in the background there there are still some some distractions um but then I I'll go into the office because that's where I can meet all of my team face to face or I can meet some of my you know business stakeholders so for me I think fully remote I think you lose some of the, the the benefits of meeting together face to face. So I think it will be a, a sort of harder proposition, I think, to sort of implement. And, and actually, like I say, not what from our survey in any way that colleagues actually wanted right now. Um, it was, like I say, a very small percentage that wanted them um, uh, fully working from home. Absolutely. That's interesting. That it is definitely that that hybrid, that hybrid route. Um, Howard, where, where, where do you where do you see the future with uh, that uh, mix of sort of fully remote and also hybrid? I think I completely agree that people are wired for connection, and it's very important to have face to face or have a close approximation of face to face when when you're meeting with your colleagues. It, it helps to uh, people to understand company culture. It helps to propagate ideas. I am interested in exploring, I mean, you held up a a virtual reality headset, but just before. Um, I was talking about this, uh, we're we're looking at the metaverse as an idea and people were talking about, well, won't it be great we can hold meetings in the metaverse? And my my thought on that is that it's a nice idea, but you've got avatars of people as opposed to actual people in the meetings. And I think I'm much more interested in perhaps augmented reality meetings. And Jesse was talking about meeting equity earlier and having people that aren't in the room and people in the room having an equal ability to participate. And I think that augmented reality potentially offers that whereby people are are working to their own benefits whether they're in the office or not in the office and if you can have an augmented reality meeting where they are equal participants but you can still use our human connections by understanding body language and reading facial expressions and and the way that we're all wired to work then i think it becomes a very interesting prospect and we can start to think about that on on a massive global scale because people then aren't disadvantaged by being on a laptop or on a screen in a meeting room where other people are interacting face to face very very well said there howard well Thank you all so much for taking the time to, to to speak with us today. This is one of those one of those sessions that I'm sat here. I need to do this uh, uh, in my company. I need to do this this part here. So thank you all so much uh, for that. Um, Jesse, where is best to find out more about yourself? What what, what is your MySpace account? Oh, my MySpace account, Jesse Skiffers. Ah, oh, if you find it, you'll find my custom backgrounds. 
Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's probably the easiest place, uh, Jesse Donny. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Laura, where, where to find out more about uh, yourself and, uh, and Standard Charter? Um, same LinkedIn, but I also have, if people are interested in employee experience, I've got a podcast called The Experience Lounge, which um, you can listen to. We talk about all things EX, digital HR, um, and I've covered hybrid working quite a few times as well in various different episodes. Um, so you can check that out on LinkedIn. And we've also got an Instagram page as well. I've just found it here, the experience, uh, lounge pod.com. Yes, that is us. Uh, Howard, where to uh, where to best find out more about yourself and some of the cool stuff that you guys are doing at Mubiquity? Uh, so, like everybody else, I'm on LinkedIn. So, uh, Howard Moore, please uh, please connect there. I'd be happy to have a chat. Um, the best place, perhaps, to start for Mobiquity is Mobiquity website. So, mobiquityinc.com. Um, we're a US and uh, European mainly based firm. So there are a couple of websites and we, we post an enormous amount of stuff on LinkedIn and we have an pod, internal podcast that's broadcast out as well in those sort of places. Always be very happy to talk to anyone about their digital experiences. Absolutely. Could uh, my team please put all those links in the in the description? That'd be most appreciated. Um, I'm Ali Patterson. I'm at Ali Patterson everywhere. So thank you all so much.